Well, here we are, nearly two weeks after the election, and what do we see? What do we see in the large cities across our country? Regardless of whom you voted for, whether you voted or not, what, what do we see? What do we see right here in Omaha, down at the old market? Protesters and signs. Clearly there are people in our country who are saying to themselves with a good level of disbelief, that man is my president? Not what they anticipated, not what they had hoped for. Not my president, the signs say. Okay. Freedom of speech. We live in a democracy. We have a two-party political system. We don't all have to agree with every point of either party. We don't even have to agree with each other. Clearly there are those in this country, those perhaps in this sanctuary, who would have preferred if someone else had been elected president. And truth be told, if we look at the popular vote, had Hillary been elected, there would have been just as many people who would have been upset with that result too. This person is my president? Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That's what his sign said. The sign that was nailed to the cross above his head. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The Jewish religious leaders didn't like that sign one bit. That man is my king? Hardly, I don't think so. Not my king. They complained to Pilate. Don't say the king of the Jews, but rather this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Well, Pilate wasn't going to change his sign. And he certainly wasn't going to take it down. But you see, it's not as though those religious leaders didn't want a king. They wanted a king, all right. They wanted a king who would pat them on the back, who would go on and on about how pious and righteous and obedient and great and awesome they were. What they didn't want, what they didn't want was a king who'd come on the scene and call them a brood of vipers, who'd call them out on their hypocrisy, who was going to call them, them of all people, to repentance. Not my king. That guy, he needs to go. He needs to be quiet. He needs to be crucified. He needs to be dead. So hours before that sign was ever posted on the cross above his head, those same hypocritical religious leaders had gathered outside of Pilate's courtroom. Let's just call it that demanding his death. But you see, they refused to go inside that courtroom. How hypocritical. They didn't want to go inside a building with the Roman governor, with a Gentile, because that would make them ceremonially unclean. That would defile them. You see, these guys wanted to be able to celebrate the Passover that day. Fascinating, isn't it? Don't go inside with a Gentile and become ceremonial and clean. But by all means, stay outside and seek the death, the murder of an innocent man. How hypocritical. How hypocritical the words, we have no king but Caesar. Are you kidding me? These guys were waiting for a king to rise up against Caesar. A king, Messiah we'll call him, who would come on the scene to drive out the Romans and to restore the glory days of, of King David. So when this would-be king came on the scene saying, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and when he talked about a kingdom with open borders that would grant citizenship even to the Gentiles, to the Samaritans, well, that was too much. That man is not my king. Well, the common people of the day had their idea of what they wanted in a king, what they thought Jesus could be 
in their king, after Jesus had miraculously fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish, what did they think? Oh, we've got the, the answer to social security right here. We'll never have to work again. This man can feed us every day, three square meals a day. We won't have to work. We can retire early. Everything's going to be great. We even have the answer to national health care. The name is Jesus. This guy, he heals the sick. He makes the lame walk, the blind see, the deaf hear. He can even raise the dead back to life. What do we got to worry about? This guy can even control the weather. We've got it made in the shade. Bread king. Not the bread of life who could feed their spiritually hungry, their spiritually starving souls. That's what they were looking for in a king. What about us? What kind of king do we want Jesus to be? Better, what do we think of Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? Certainly we want him to guard us. We want him to look out for us. We want him to protect us here on earth, command his angels as he's promised, concerning us in all our ways. We want him to provide our daily bread. We want him to give us all that we need, clothing and shoes, food and drink. But don't we want more than that from Jesus, our king? And I'm not talking about feeding our spiritually hungry souls with the bread of life, and living water. I'm saying this, if Jesus, really, you're my king, then don't I have the right to expect that you're going to keep all the hurt and all the pain and all the suffering and all the struggles and all the bad stuff away from me, far away from me, forgetting that he knows what's best for us, forgetting that sometimes he can use the bad in our life to work it for our good as he's, he's promised. We kind of expect from this king, if he's worth his salt, to give us that life of ease. We shouldn't have any difficulty. Smooth sailing, right? Smooth road ahead. And then when that doesn't happen, when when the chemo doesn't work, or when the family isn't there, and when the friends aren't supporting, and when the bills are greater than the income, or when the political scene in our country is one of chaos, or when there's still violence in the streets and in the world, and when when ignorance seems to be reigning, aren't we asking, aren't we saying to ourselves with some level of disbelief, that man is my king? Hardly, I don't think so, not my king. Aren't we the ones who want to be changing the sign above his head on his cross? He only claimed to be a king. You, you tell me if you haven't protested one of his decisions, one of his rulings, one of his actions. Aren't we the ones carrying around the sign that says, not my king? Oh, not a literal sign, not a piece of cardboard with some paint splattered on it, but isn't that what our our fearful hearts and our doubting minds and our angry words and our nervous actions all say? Not my king. Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, and yet so many times our, our actions and our priorities in life so focused here and not focused there that we too want Jesus to be our bread king, our helper king, our healer king, our give me everything I want right now kind of king. Or, or we fall into the same thing as the, the religious leaders, the same hypocrisy to, to think we want a king who can come and praise us, a king who can come and pat us on the back and say how awesome we are and how faithful we are in our, in our church attendance or how amazing our service is and, and go on and on. Like Pilate and those religious leaders and the common people of the day, We don't seem to get it at times when Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. He said, if it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. I don't know if you follow the news at all. I don't know if you heard this, but they're they're saying it's difficult. It has been difficult. It will continue to be difficult to to keep President-elect Trump safe while he's at home in New York City there in Trump Tower because of the massive lobby open to the public with its dining and shopping with the nearly 50 floors of apartments and offices with the three-story 
penthouse up there on the top and the tall buildings that surround it and the busy streets that wrap around it and the, the airspace, which is now a no-fly zone above it, difficult to keep him safe when he's there. And yet I'm confident the, the Secret Service, with help from the U.S. military, the NYPD, they're going to keep him safe, right? That's what they do, and they do it well. Jesus could have had the best protection, the best security, the best secret service ever in this world, out of this world. His angels, legions of angels, not to mention his own almighty power. But he chose not to. He chose not to prevent his arrest. He chose not to fight back. He chose not to set up a throne in Jerusalem or anywhere else in this world because he's not that kind of a king. And because he's not that kind of a king, we never on our own would have ever chosen, dare I say elected, him to be our king. But there's the grace. Because Jesus is exactly the king we needed him to be beaten and bruised and bloodied. That man's my king. A crown of thorns, a dusty robe, a reed for a scepter. That man is my king. No, no triumphal procession through the city, just crawling on his hands and knees with a cross on his back to get outside the city. That man is is my king. No trumpet blast to announce his arrival there on Calvary, just the repeated ping of a hammer driving nails through his flesh. That man is my king. He didn't set himself up on a lofty throne out there on that, on that hill, but rather he was lifted up on two pieces of blood-stained lumber. That man is my king. A condemned criminal is my king. The one the Father punished so he could spare me is my king. The one the Father forsook so that he could forgive me, that man is my king. He took my place. He endured my punishment. He died my death. He stormed Calvary's battlefield with all the courage and all the strength he could muster, and he lost his life in that battle. But he won the victory. His tomb is empty. He won my freedom. My citizenship is in heaven. And so is yours. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That man's my King. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess our Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. They begin on page four in the bulletin.